It's my very great pleasure today to welcome today's view from the top speaker, Ted Turner. Uh, it's difficult to know where to begin when introducing someone like Ted Turner because he has made an impact in so many different areas. He is primarily known in the business world for his impact on the media, which began when he took over a billboard advertising business when he was 24 years old. He used profits from this enterprise to enter cable television just as it was beginning to take hold in the US. In what was an audacious move at the time, he launched a 24-hour cable news network in 1980. CNN was the first all-news TV network in the US. At the time, many questioned how anybody could fill the airwaves with news content continuously. Today, it is difficult to imagine what news and politics was like before 24-hour coverage existed. After launching CNN, Ted began buying media content, including the film studio MGM, and used the library to create multiple successful cable franchises, including TNT and Turner Classic Movies. The resulting Turner Broadcasting Systems eventually merged with Time Warner in 1996. Mr. Turner was vice chairman of Time Warner and its largest stockholder when the company merged with AOL in 2000 in what I'm sure Mr. Turner would agree with perfect hindsight was probably not optimal timing. <laughs> but in many respects, Ted is not here to talk about business at all. He's on campus to attend a meeting of the United Nations Foundation where he is chair of the board. The UN Foundation was established with Ted's pledge of $1 billion in 1998, the largest philanthropic gift of its time. The foundation was established to strengthen and support the UN and its causes through a blend of advocacy, grant making, and partnerships. These causes include children's health, climate and energy, sustainable development, women, and population initiatives. Ted is also an outspoken environmentalist. And as the largest landowner in the United States, with more than two million acres of land, an area larger than the states of Delaware and Rhode Island combined, his decision to focus on ecological sustainability in land management has already had a major impact. Ted is owner of the Atlanta Braves baseball team and Atlanta Hawks basketball team. Not content to just stand on the sidelines, however, he also was skipper of a winning America's Cup sailing team in 1977. He is known to be outspoken and controversial, earning him the nickname, the mouth from the south. But he has also been named other things, such as Man of the Year by Time Magazine and Humanist of the Year by the American Humanist Association. While this is only a partial list of accomplishments, one theme that ought to be abundantly clear is that when Ted Turner does something, he does not do it meekly. It should make for an interesting discussion today. Ted is going to be interviewed by Jason Lee Keenan, one of our second year student leaders of the speaker series before opening the discussion to Q&A. Jason also has a record in the media business, having worked for Hulu during the summer and for Disney prior to business school, as well as Goldman Sachs and Texas Pacific Group. I'm not sure how Jason is at sailing, but he's an impressive classical pianist. Please join me today in welcoming Ted Turner to the Stanford Graduate School of Business. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you again, Mr. Turner, for coming to Ted. speak with us today. Sorry, I'll call you Ted. That is the name of your book, right? Right. Um, so I thought I'd start off by asking you a question on entrepreneurship. As you probably know, Stanford is well known for inspiring entrepreneurship amongst its students, and I'm sure many of the students in the audience today one day would like to start their own company. As the founder of many companies, including CNN, TBS, uh, Ted's Montana Grill, and Turner Renewable Energy, could you talk to us a little bit about the challenges you faced in starting new businesses? Um, it's a lot of work. It's a lot of work, and you've got to have a, uh, a good concept of what you want to do. 
and uh, and you need to have some uh, knowledge of how to obtain capital because almost any business of any size requires uh, capital. And then, I, I hate to say it, but you can't, you can't do it in, in, in just a couple of lines. Uh, when I get asked that question, though, when I get asked at groups like this, I say, you know, the secret of success in business is early to bed, early to rise, work like hell and advertise. <laughs> you know, but, that's about as good as there is anything. But, but, but I would recommend, because in a book you can cover it better. That's why I wrote the book. <laughs> that sounds like advertising. And also me. I don't have to say the same, the same damn thing over and over again, you know. So let me, let me One ask. One of the things we did a lot in television, we had a lot of reruns. And uh, <laughs> when you get over 70, life just turns into one big rerun. <laughs> So you've founded these companies over a period of 30 years. Have the leadership challenges 50 years. 50 years. Have the leadership challenges changed over that time? Uh, no, not really. I don't think. Still pretty much the same thing. Don't forget to advertise. <laughs> Shifting gears then for a sec. <laughs> So in 1998, you founded the UN Foundation with an historic $1 billion donation. What motivated you to make this donation, and why the United Nations? The UN was in a lot of trouble. Uh, they were in financial trouble. And uh, it, this was back before governments bailed out uh, companies. This was a time when companies and individuals bailed out governments. <laughs> and uh, at the, US, the U United States was over a billion dollars in arrears on their dues to the UN, and the UN couldn't pay their peacekeepers. We're the biggest uh, contributor, and we were almost two years behind in, in our payments. And I, it, it drove me crazy, because I, 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 I'm a student of history, and I read a lot when I was uh, younger, studied history very, very carefully, and I don't think we'd be here today without the United Nations. I think the United Nations did for all the things that it didn't do and it's not perfect, like our federal government's not perfect, like state government's not perfect, uh, but, but it did, maybe it was luck, but we did prevent World War III. And if we had had a World War III, particularly about the time of the Cuban Missile Crisis, which is the closest we came, um, we'd probably all be dead. And that's worth saving. You know, something that saves everybody is worth hanging on to. And um, I was trying to figure out how I could get the money to the UN because all of a sudden I had been worth, I was worth a couple billion dollars. And it happened real quickly. My stock went up when CNN turned the corner. In a period of just a few years, I went from just about broke to worth, well, at the high point, close to 10 billion. And uh, so I had, I had the money. And I, the first thing I thought is, is, why don't I go to the UN and buy the debt at, at a discount, you know, offered at business school, right, at 20 percent, <laughs> because, and, and, and then I could, I could uh, present the bill to be paid. The UN couldn't push the United States because they wanted to stay a member. They had to be real nice, even though, if you owe somebody a lot of money, you're supposed to be nice to them anyway. That's what we got to forget about China. We've got to be nice to China because we owe them a trillion dollars. <laughs> I, an idea how we could get rid of that, too, real quickly is, is uh, you know, China wants to build an aircraft carrier because they'd like to, they've got a lot of money now and they don't know what to do with some of it. Aircraft carriers aren't much help in a place like Afghanistan. And we've got, I don't know, what, 12 battle groups? And we owe China a trillion dollars. Why don't we sit down with them and say, look, you guys want aircraft carriers. We can't use them in Afghanistan and Iraq and all the wars we're fighting. They weren't very helpful in Vietnam either. We'll sell you. We'll give you our aircraft carriers if you write off the debt. And then you can have a specific fleet. You know? What are you going to do with it? I, I really think war is totally obsolete. That's, but anyway, I was going to buy <laughs> I was going to buy the debt and then sue the United States for the full face amount, pick up a couple hundred million dollars uh, on, on the deal. And I checked with my lawyers, and uh, 
They said you can't do that. An individual can't bring a lawsuit against the United States <laughs> for paid, unpaid uh, bills. <laughs> so I, I <laughs> that, that didn't work. And it took me, took me a while because I kept thinking, I, when I, it's like CNN. I, it, I, I spent th three years just thinking about it before I even started it. I was just amazed that CBS, NBC, or, or it, CBS didn't, didn't do it because they had all the infrastructure, they had the news department, they had the bureaus, all they would have had to do was, was do it, but they didn't have the imagination. And that's another good thing to do, is go into a business where the people that are running it are a bunch of dumbasses. <laughs> <laughs> that makes it easy to have dumb competitors is uh, one of the best ways to get started. So when you think about the UN Foundation today, uh, what are the most critical issues that it's working on and what are you most proud of in terms of what they've accomplished so far? Well, the thing that, that, that we're working on the most is uh, trying to eradicate uh, the, the uh, intractable diseases that we, well, they're not intractable because they, and, and we've done it with partnerships with, with Gates, with Rotary, for instance, with polio. We are maybe one year away, thanks to some breaks that we got, uh, from eradicating polio. And that will only be the second disease in the history of the world that's ever been eradicated, po smallpox being the other one. That will be a gigantic win. For those of you that are sports fans, which is just about everybody, you know, it's like we need a W. Humanity needs a W. When, well, last week, somebody blew up, refugees were standing in line to get a little food in, a, in bowls and somebody killed 35 of them. What in the hell are you bombing refugees for? I mean, wh what does that accomplish? What, are they a different religion? What, what in the name of God are we doing? Why don't we start acting like civilized, educated, decent, kind-hearted human beings? That's why don't we start doing that? It, it's not that hard. I spent my whole life doing it, and it's been a ball. <laughs> so you've spoken... Uh, Most people like to help other people, like in Haiti. I mean, we spent a million dollars the first day, you know, and millions and millions of dollars. Most people want to help other people. Who in this room would like to bomb somebody? Not one person. How many people want to help other people? Yeah, that's right. That's, that's humanity. That's, that's, why don't we start acting like human beings? One of the topics you've spoken out a lot about, and I think you're most passionate about, is climate change. Um, one of them. Because it, it poses a real threat to us. So if you were running this country, what are the three things you would do to help combat this issue? Well, why three? <laughs> Isn't that awfully arbitrary? <laughs> Okay, how about the that's seven a, things That's you like do. my competitors at CBS, NBC, and ABC. They only thought of three, but I thought of ten ways to attack them. And they, <laughs> they stopped me on the first three, but I got them with the other seven. You didn't answer the question, though, so what would you do? No, because it was such a dumb question. <laughs> it actually was... Well, one, I'd ask people to turn out the lights. You know, basically, uh, the, the, the cheapest and, and, and quickest way to make progress is to, is to conserve, to conserve energy. Walk, don't drive, and, you know, so that, that sort of thing. And then what we have to do is uh, switch over to, it's time to say goodbye to coal and oil and replace them with uh, renewable energy, with solar, wind, possibly geothermal, if we can figure, figure out how to do it. We should be doing a lot of research on it because it has tremendous potential. And uh, it's time that the, the Industrial Revolution was started with burning coal. It's time, time to say goodbye to it. We're burning too much of it, and it's, uh, and it's poisonous, and we're going we're gonna to run out of it anyway. But, uh, but it's time to say goodbye to coal. And I mean, say goodbye to coal. To those 35 senators from the coal states, they're going to vote for coal. They don't care what happens. They do have care what happens to the country. But they care more about whether they get reelected than anything else. We're going to have to uh, get our government to work better. And uh, because 
then they have to be able to do more than one thing at a time. I mean, I ran CNN and the Cartoon Network at the same time. <laughs> and we have to multitask. I mean, they, they just stop. <laughs> the whole country comes to a halt for six months while they get the, get the uh, health care bill through. Why can't they do two or three bills at one time, you know? I mean, you take more than one course, don't you? <laughs> Christ's sake, I mean, you know. <laughs> we got to get with the program. So you Speed may things up a bit. Go into high gear. I like that. <laughs> so you, you mentioned China before, and I think one of the big challenges with uh, addressing climate change is it's really a global issue. And countries like China and India are, are projected to be the biggest producers of carbon emissions over the next decade. Yeah, well, China is very, very close to it right now. So what should the U.S. be doing to figure out the global dynamics here? Basically, there's a lot of people thinking of it, thinking about it, and, and, and working on it. I'm, I am, and uh, uh, it's, we, we just gotta, we gotta keep with it. We can't really afford to lose this one. And it's not just climate change. Climate change is a symptom of overpopulation and too many people using too much stuff. If we, what we have to do is we've gotta stabilize the population uh, and, 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 and quickly because we can't handle 9 billion people. With 6.7 billion, when I was born in 1938, there were only 2 billion people in the world. In, 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 in the lifetime of one person in those 70 years, we've increased the number of people on the planet by three and a half times. That's, that's gigantic. Nothing like that ever, ever happened before. If we'd have had that many more elephants, for Christ's sake, we'd all be elephant dung, you know. <laughs> So we've got, to, uh, we've got to go, what we really need to do, and Paul Ehrlich, I don't know if he's around, but he, he's involved here, I think. I, I read the population bomb 30 years ago, and uh, he, he feels like, because I talked to him, I had him out for a weekend 30 years ago uh, when I was doing my research on population, and uh, he thought that the world population ought to be between two and two and a half billion people, that with that we could support... Uh, you know, internal combustion engines, that there wouldn't be so many people that would overwhelm the, uh, the, the resource base. The, the planet's collapsing all around us. The ocean fisheries are collapsing from overfishing. There's the topsoil the, 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 uh, top is eroding away uh, from farming, the kind of farming that we do where we plow and, the, and wind and, and uh, water erosion are washing the, washing the topsoil away. We've got to take better care of the planet uh, because without, without uh, a healthy environment, it's the population's not going to make it. And with, the, and with that 6.7 billion uh, population, there's a billion people going to bed hungry at night. What are we going to do if we get two or three billion more people? And that's where we're headed if we keep uh, going the way that we're, that we're going. So we have to do that first because that's the most important thing. And, and we, or we have to do it simultaneously. So we're going to have to multitask. We're going to have to stop doing the dumb things and start doing the smart things. And we've got to start with you. Your, your generation has got to be the one that does it because if you wait till another generation before you start turning things around, it's going to be too late. So, and, and, and global warming or climate change is just uh, one symptom of a sick planet because of too many people using too much stuff. Going back to business for a second, um, over the last 10 years, business, business has gotten a bad rap. Um, from Enron to the recent financial crisis. A lot of it was deserved. I would say business leaders are more vilified <laughs> than glorified. What do you think the reason is for that? Um, and what can we do to change that trend? <laughs> it should have been vilified. You know, just like uh, the good guys ought to be uh, lionized, like me. <laughs> no, I never did anything wrong. Uh, not anything substantially wrong. <laughs> not that I got caught. Well, I would have gotten caught, too, because I was high profile enough, and they were, enough people would have liked me. Yeah, you've you got to play by the rules. You've got to, uh, and it's not that hard. You can, you can make billions doing it, playing by the rules and doing it honestly, if you're smart enough and work hard enough. So on the topic of the financial crisis, reportedly in 2007, you transferred almost all of your financial portfolio to cash. 
successfully anticipating bonds. the crisis, right. okay, or bonds. But that's that, that wasn't the reason I did it. So I was going to ask you, I had, what uh, was the reason? I had lost uh, between seven and eight billion on the AOL transaction, <laughs> and gone from eight or nine billion, and for a, a brief moment, I think the high I went over ten, uh, and I was back down to under two, and I was just, I, and that was in time more. I thought, you know, I, I, I was. Uh, like cashing in my chips when I merged with Tom Warner, and 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 and, uh, and but but I lost so much and sit back with AOL. It was just hard to believe that we could make so many mistakes. It was really just one merging with them without doing adequate due diligence and finding out that the books were cooked and we didn't know it. The auditors didn't catch it, but of course we only did one day of due diligence. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> Yeah, it's on a $40 billion deal, or $100 billion deal, depending on what you're grossing up. So I, I just wanted to hang on, because there's nothing worse than being a broke old man who once was rich. <laughs> and uh, I want to be able to have enough money to cover my funeral <laughs> without having to uh, have my children cough it up. Do you think there are steps we should have taken to prevent the financial crisis? Yeah. We should not have uh, borrowed so much money. I don't know, a penny to a soul and haven't for a long time. I think, I think you ought to aim in your business career and in your life to be out of debt by the time you're 60 and not owe anything on your house or anything else. That, and, and the reason for that is because after 60, it's hard to find a job. People don't want you because of medical care. You know, you've got uh, people, older people have more health problems than younger people and so forth. It's really hard, hard to find a job over 60 unless you want to be a greeter at Walmart. You know, it's, uh, I know because I haven't had a job in over 10 years. That's one reason I had to start these philanthropies. And I had to have some kind of activity. So if I don't have it coming in, at least I can have it going out. <laughs> Movement, you know, just don't stand still, do something. Are there any uh, CEOs or business leaders today that you admire? Yeah. I, I, I like Warren Buffett. And I like, I, I like Bill Gates. I like the winners. That, that we, the, and it, there's some other ones. <laughs> um, so I guess, you know, looking back, you founded a media empire, became a billionaire, started a restaurant chain. Won the World Series. Won the World Series. That was important. Invested in renewable energy, married a movie star. For those people in the audience <laughs> who aspire to do something like that, do you have any advice to us going out into the workforce? Pump a lot of iron. It's tiring. But I really had a great time. I've, ha I've, I've had a great life, and I'm having a great life right now. I really am. Well, before we turn it over to uh, the audience here for some questions, um, in 2008, you celebrated your 70th birthday with a party in Atlanta, and reportedly, you spent some time reading poetry to the guests. And no, I didn't. I, I, I quoted it from memory. <laughs> Even better. So you said at the time that the words that I have meant the most to you too. on integrity are from Shakespeare. Would you like to share some of that with us? I think it's uh, Richard III. It's short. It's the best lines on integrity that I've ever, that I've ever <clears throat> heard. My honor is my life. We live in one. Take honor from me, and my life is done. Then pray, my liege, my honor let me try. For that I live, and for that will I die. Thank you very much. I'm going to give you the other two that I gave at my birthday, too. The, the lines that on courage, because if you're going to be successful in business, you've got to have a lot of courage. <clears throat> then step forward, Horatius. This is from Horatius at the Bridge by Thomas Macaulay. Then step forward, Horatius, the captain of the gate. He said, to every man of woman born, death cometh soon or late. And how can man die better than facing fearful odds for the ashes of his fathers and the temples of his gods? 
Hew down the bridge, Sir Council, with all the speed ye may. I, with but two beside me, will hold the foe in play. On yon narrow span a thousand might well be stopped by three. Now who will stand on either hand and guard the bridge with me? Pretty strong. They stopped the whole Etruscan army. And the last one is the longest one. And I really <laughs> hope I don't forget a line in it. But let me, And it's also from Richard III. And it's about humility. No matter where of comfort no man speak, let's talk of worms, of graves, and epitaphs. Make dust our paper and with rainy eyes write sorrow on the bosom of earth. Let's choose executors and talk of wills. And yet not so, for what can we bequeath save our deposed bodies to the ground? Our lands, our lives, and all our bowling brokes. And nothing can we call our own save death. And that small model of the barren earth that serves as paste and cover to our bones. For God's sake, let us sit upon the ground and tell sad stories of the death of kings. How some have been deposed, some slain in war, some haunted by the ghosts they have depo deposed, some poisoned by their wives, some sleeping killed, all murdered. For within the hollow crown that rounds the mortal temples of a king, keeps death his watch. And there the Annex sits, scoffing at his state and grinning at his pomp, infusing him with self and vain conceit as if this flesh which walls about our life were brass impregnable and comes at the last and with a little pin bores through his castle wall and farewell, king. Cover your heads and mock not flesh and blood with solemn reverence. Throw away respect, tradition, form, and ceremonious duty. I live with bread like you, feel want, taste grief, need friends. Subjected thus, how can you say to me, I am a king? My company in 1970, the first year in the television business, there were 35 employees, and we did $600,000 and lost $900,000, almost a million. That same exact company, 30 years later, did $2.5 billion, had 12,000 employees, and made $600 million. That was the year I merged with Tom Warner. That, that's what you could do, just say, Smoke them. The stock went up 2,000 for one during that time. And that's how you make a, you want to be a billionaire? Start with nothing and turn it into a fortune. <laughs> <laughs> so with that, we'd like to open it up to questions from the audience. Um, please take a mic and make sure to stand up. Sorry. Thanks very much for coming today. I uh, wanted to ask you a question about uh, mentorship. I'm wondering uh, who have been some of your biggest mentors over your career, and what are some of the biggest lessons you've learned from them? My father was definitely the biggest one. He taught me about business. It was, uh, he was in the billboard business, and it was a real easy business. You leased the space, put up a sign, and then rented it to an advertiser for enough to have a profit. But I wanted to do more with my life and just make money. So I wanted to get into television where I could do programming. I wanted, I had ideas for, for programs. And so that's what I, but, but he was, he taught me about how to, you know, the, what profits and losses were and so forth. Mr. Turner, Ted, thank you for joining yeah. us. Ted, <laughs> thank you for joining us today. During this conversation, we talked about both your experience as an entrepreneur fighting against the odds and also for your passion about the environment and a lot of the challenges that even people here at Stanford have characterized in our global ecosystem. I was wondering if you could take a pass at bringing those two together and speak to, one, to what extent, um, what advice you have for business leaders who want to have an impact in those issues, 
And two, do you have any specific, are there any specific opportunities that excite you outside of energy, whether it be water, soil, agriculture, et cetera? Well, I think of, I, I think of uh, soil and, and water and energy t t t together, uh, but, but I think that's, that's where I would, if I was starting in business today, that's, that's where I'd go because we've got to completely rebuild our whole energy system all over the world. Uh, we've got to phase out coal and, and uh, oil. We, I, I, I go along with Boone Pickens that we ought to use uh, natural gas as a bridge fuel to when we're, when we're completely uh, reliant on, on solar, wind, and, and uh, perhaps some geothermal and, uh, and bio, biofuels. Um, that that's where, where where I'd go. I think that's where the, the, the growth industries for the for the for the future are, at least for the immediate future, for the next 30, 40 years. And I'm in I'm personally going there myself. I we're building uh, one of the largest solar installations in New Mexico. With I partnered with the Southern Company, which is a big utility, the biggest one in the southeast, one of the biggest ones in the country. And their, half of their power is generated from coal. And, uh, but I, what I'm doing is I'm partnering up with them and trying to work with them and to show them that we can go, that they can go with clean energy rather than fight them. Uh, but, but I've been known to do a little fighting too <laughs> from time to time. <laughs> yes, sir. Thanks, Ted, for coming. Um, Stephen van Helden, I'm a first year student here at the GSB. So a lot of the the business ideas that you've spoken about have been, you know, business ideas with a social mission. Um, media in itself is effectively a business is a business that does have a large social mission, and I think that is around education. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about getting the right trade off between propaganda and education, and how much mass appeal you get versus, you know, a smaller a smaller audience, and how you at you know and CNN broadly have kind of struggled with that. Well, not necessarily you struggled with that, but how you found that, that sort of trade-off. I'm going to ask, because I'm hard of hearing. They were about three or four questions there. <laughs> That's very complex. I mean, it takes a, a, a volumes. That's a good question. And you have to, as far as, uh, as, far as uh, uh, just t take the news media, take the news network, take CNN. They're being beaten in the ratings by Fox which uh, I knew that that was where the greatest threat to CNN would come from. It would come from a right-wing network. This was before I even started CNN. That they're because, and, and, and they have done a good job of filling that niche. On the one hand, you could say that they're not as responsible as I would like to see them, see them be, but they're very successful. And, and sometimes doing the wrong thing is more successful than doing the right thing. And, and that's one of the uh, hardest things about business. I, I, I couldn't do the wrong thing and make money on it. I, I, I just, I had too much pride to do that. I, I, I'd, I'd rather not be successful than be successful by doing the wrong thing. And uh, for me, it worked. Luckily, it doesn't work for everybody. It, it's, it's a very hard thing to, uh, to balance. It, it really is. And that, and that, you know, it's one thing just to go into business to make some money. But most people have enough trouble. That's hard to do by itself. And then if you have a strong so sense of social consciousness on top of that, that just is another layer of complexity to it. But I would strongly recommend, because I did it and was successful that way, that, uh, that you go strive that way to, to, to do it with a, with a conscience that what you do is something you can be proud of. And uh, uh, because I think in the long run, that's really more important, that you have your pride and that you did good with your life rather than just making a whole lot of money. But it's not easy. Hi, Ted. Uh, my name is Edward Castaño. Um, I grew up watching Captain Planet and wanted to thank you for that. 
Uh, of all the things I did, I'm, I'm really proud of Captain Planet. How many, how many people in the room grew up on Captain Planet? Look around. If we save this world, it's going to be partially because of Captain Planet. <laughs> no, I'm serious. That's right, because Captain Planet taught you about environmental stewardship, didn't it? I mean, I came up with the idea that I said, because I had the Cartoon Network, I, was, I, had, I had already bought Tom and Jerry, Bugs Bunny. I mean, I had everything. I had the Flintstones. I had, <laughs> I had Yogi Bear. I had Yogi Bear. I had the Jetsons. I had all I had. I mean, I was the cartoon king. And, I, and then I bought all the movies. I had Gone with the Wind, Citizen Kane. I just, oh, it was so great. <laughs> oh, what fun. Anyway, but Captain Planet, I... The girls and the boys in it were both uh, the same. You know, they, 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 the girls were just as smart as the guys. Yep, and they, and they were kids from all over the world. Kwame from Africa, right? Wheeler from New York. G from Asia. She was a composite Asian girl. <laughs> Linka from the Soviet Union, and we had to change it to Russia because the Soviet Union disappeared while Captain <laughs> Planet was running. It ran all over the world, including Russia, including China, and they won't run it. I, if I could do one thing at Time Warner to get Captain Planet back on the Cartoon Network at a decent time so we can train today's kids, because it, the stories are still, you know, they're timeless. They are. Um, so as you mentioned... <laughs> so as, as you mentioned earlier, um, there's a lot of energy, um, effort being expended to deal with the symptoms of environmental problems. Um, and of the $2.4 trillion that our federal government collects um, in taxes, 95% of that comes from taxing wealth, innovation, labor, and less than 5% of that comes from taxing um, uh, activities that generate negative externalities, uh, pollution, resource depletion, waste, inefficiency. <laughs> Um, so to my question, what do you see as, like, as the best way to actually address the root cause of environmental problems uh, instead of just dealing with the symptoms? I know you mentioned earlier uh, population control. Uh, you have any other Not ideas? Not population control. Family planning. Family planning, yes. People don't like to be controlled, okay. but they like to plan. All right. <laughs> Population it, it, planning, it's then? <laughs> it, it's, it's very important. That's why I, I, I forbade the, uh, the, the TV announcers on CNN to use the word foreign, because it was, CNN was going all over the world. It looked really stupid. Foreign, who's far? Everybody was close together now, because we've interconnected the whole world. So, but what's the, what's the question? So, uh, what do you... That was a long question, yeah. young man. How... What are some ways in which we can deal with the root cause of environmental problems? What do you see as the most effective ways? Should we be, uh, for example, taxing polluters? Ta taxing ta polluters? Absolutely. Tax the polluters, you bet. And then <laughs> rebate the ta Absolutely. That's who should be paying for it. That's who, you know, why should we be paying for somebody else's pollution? That's not the solution. And if I could follow up, what do you, what do you see as the role of education uh, versus tax, technology. Tax gasoline, you know. And he was also asking, do you see education playing a role in this as well? Of course. <laughs> Everything plays a role in it. Captain Planet was television, but it was educational television, right? Sure, education is extremely important. If we don't have a good educational system that teaches... Ger Germany had a great educational system in 1935. The only problem was it was preaching hatred. You know, I mean, they were saying that uh, the educational system was uh, anti-Semitic there. But, but we, well, we need an education system that strongly uh, educates us about the environment and how important it is to preserve it. You bet. It's not just something that we just can, can rape and pillage and, uh, and, 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 and expect it to support us. I, I want to see a sustainable. I'd like to see... What's wrong with the concept of where 5,000 years from now people are still here, living in uh, harmony with nature, right, and having a great life? Well, I, I think what we've done, one of the biggest mistakes we've made in America and in the Western world to a smaller degree, but in America, is, is we've emphasized that uh, how much money you have and how much you spend is what determines how happy you are. That's not right. The thing that really determines your happiness is your relationships. 
with your family, with your friends. And, and we need to have, we need to change over. That's what got us in all this financial problems. People wanted to spend more money, so they borrowed, went out and borrowed more than their house was worth against their house. The banks lent them the money. That was the bank's mistake. We were all, but it's our fault. That, that we got in this problem. It basically was because we were spending more. Uh, I, George Soros figured it out. I think 6% a year for five, the last five years we spent more than, than we were earning. And borrowing the money from the Chinese, it can't operate like that. What we should do is live in smaller houses, and they're building smaller houses now, smaller houses and smaller automobiles. I drive a Prius. That's my main car. You know, I'm a billionaire still. And, uh, and I don't have a gigantic house. I got a nice house, and I'll tell you, I do. I do. But, it's, <laughs> but it's not gigantic. I mean, you know, I don't feel guilty about living there. And, um, and, 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 and put more emphasis. Get to know your next door neighbors. Don't drive all the way across town, but get to know the people next door and play bridge with them. You know, it doesn't cost anything, for Christ's sake. You know, cook dinner together. You have more fun than you do if you go out and drink too much at some fancy restaurant. Anyway, and I'm in the restaurant business, so please go out to the moderately priced restaurant. <laughs> <laughs> like Ted's Montana Grill. We're not in California yet. <laughs> anyway, does that answer the question? That's a, you guys are asking, you guys and girls are asking tough questions. Hi. But um, I can handle it. Aish Washington, another first year MBA student here. You mentioned earlier that government should work better, and I wondered how you think the 24-hour news cycle either helps or perhaps hinders governments from working as well as they should do. Well, it depends on uh, how, it's, uh, how it's used. If it's used to turn people against the government, uh, it's got, it, my concept of, of the way I tried to run CNN was to tell the truth in a non uh, a non-threatening, non-threatening way, and to wh whenever there were controversial issues, to seek out the leading proponents of both sides and let let them air their opinions and let the viewers make up their own own minds. Some some of this uh, talk radio now tries to make up the, your mind for you and convince you that they're right, you know, and they're right wing or whatever, um, or left wing. But, but that's the way, the way I tried to do it. It's very complicated. It's, th these are not, uh, you're, you're, we'd expect Stanford Business School postgraduate, you'd expect good questions, and, they, and we're getting them. They're the most complicated questions that, uh, that you could ask, but that's okay. I, I just wish I could answer them better, but the answers can't be simple. They have to be, uh, com they're, they're complex by their very nature. Complex answers to complex questions. Hi, Ted. David Eberstein here, and I'm a second-year MBA candidate. This one might be a little bit easier, but Malcolm Glad Gladwell recently profiled you as an entrepreneur, and you kind of touched on this a little bit earlier uh, in terms of he profiled entrepreneurs as not being risk-takers, but rather calculating opportunistic predators. Um, I'd like to get you your, your view on that, and your, if, do you agree with him? Or how you be I, yourself? Who, who, who am I agreeing with? Uh, Malcolm, Malcolm Gladwell. I don't even know who he is. Uh, he's a, <laughs> he's a, uh, an author. Fair enough. Uh, I don't remember being interviewed by anybody by that name, but I, maybe I was. Well, the 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 thrust of the article what was. Networks he with? He's a Harvard psychologist. Oh, in a New York Times and New, New Yorker, Yorker the columnist. The New Yorker. The New Yorker. I don't. I, I do a lot of interviews. So the uh, so the the thrust of the of the piece was about entrepreneurs as being more calculating uh, predators, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. as opposed to risk takers. How we article. how we commonly I, I, view them. I I really don't remember much about it. Do, do you agree with my his memory? So bad I can't remember. I can't remember whether I got Parkinson's or Alzheimer's. So I guess my question. So I, that's an original. So I guess I got. <laughs> The, 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 uh, the, the thrust of the question, I'm sorry, I'm not being clear. Do you, do you view yourself as a risk taker or yeah. in, in, in terms of... Okay. It was risky coming here. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Thank we you. We were running late and you should have seen how fast we drove across town. Oh, my God. I'm lucky to be here. Do we have any more questions? 
Yeah, go ahead. Hi, Ted. Uh, Alex Lenahan, first year MBA. Um, you came into television at a time of large transition, and I think a lot of people would say that the television industry is changing a lot right now, too, with content being delivered uh, over the internet and video on demand, everything like that. I was wondering if you could just speak for a second on where you see uh, the media and the television industry going in the next five, ten years, or if you have a view on that. I don't know. <laughs> I'm not in the media business anymore. I've moved on to energy, and I'm having enough trouble keeping up with that. You've got to keep up with solar. They've got a magazine that comes out every week. You've got wind. Got to read that every week. Geothermal. Got to read that every week. I, see, I read The Economist, that's my basic news source, because I need to know what's going on in the world, even though I don't have CNN anymore. But I, with my work at the UN, I have to know everything that's going on everywhere all the time. And just trying to keep up with what, where it's wearing my behind out. I got to keep up with all the environmental stuff. I got to, every week I call somebody up over at uh, TBS and try and get them to put Captain Planet back on. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, I'll tell you what y'all could do. Let's see, I'm trying to remember who's the chairman of Time Warner now. It happens that he's actually a GSB alumnus. Yeah, who is it? Jeff Bukas. Jeff Bukas. Why don't y'all write Jeff Bukas a letter, each individually saying, I'm a, Cap I'm a planeteer, put Captain Planet back on. <laughs> so I think we have time for one more question. Uh, Ted, I, I want, I'm a first year MBA from India. Just had a question. What's your biggest, uh, in your view, what's your biggest accomplishment and your biggest regret in life? Biggest regret? Right. That my marriages didn't work out. That really is. Uh, uh, I've been married three times. And uh, the biggest accomplishment uh, probably was Turner Broadcasting and specifically uh, CNN. It was the first global news network. It was the first global network and the first 24-hour news, uh, news source. So it was, it was, it was uh, groundbreaking, I think it's fair to say. Everyone, please join me in thanking Mr. Turner for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you very much. Not bad.